Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Soulcast Media Live event. It is so fantastic seeing you all. I was behind the scenes looking at where everybody was dialing in from. And we have folks from all over the states here in the US, but we also have folks dialing in from around the world. And it is so amazing to see how an event like this can truly draw in an international crowd. So first of all, I want to say welcome. Continue to put into the chat function where you are dialing in from. I'm here in California and it's a it's a nice cool like 75 degrees right now so I cannot complain. My guest Libby is dialing in from Oregon which I'm sure she's going to share in just a little bit. But I just want to welcome you all to navigate change and thrive at work. Now, for those who've been following me and the work that I've been doing, it's a little different from the communications work that I typically focus on whenever I put together these events. It's always something around public speaking, uh, communicating in difficult times, or you know, advocating for yourself is another big one. But when I was talking to my team about what we wanted our next topic to be, this topic, navigating change and thriving at work was something that felt so timely and so relevant. And here's the thing, even if there isn't too much change, let's say happening in your work right now, or you feel perfectly happy, hey, that's great. It still helps for us to think about how we can get into that mindset to allow us to be in that more flexible state of mind. It's actually something I'm going to be talking about in just a little bit, so I'm going to preview it. But before we get started, I want to do a quick intro of who I am and the work that I do if this is the first time we are meeting. Uh, my name is Jessica Chen, and I'm the founder and CEO of Soulcast Media, and we are a communications training company. So we go into Fortune 500 companies, and I do a lot of speaking engagements as well as training, training to help people become more confident communicators. Prior to Soulcast Media, I used to be on TV. I was a former television journalist, ABC, NBC. I was in New York for a few years. And one of the reasons why I decided to leave news and start Soulcast Media was because communications was not something I was good at. Um, part of it was personality. I'm fairly shy and introverted, but part of it was also cultural. You know, I wasn't really taught the skills I felt that would help me build that confidence speaking up in the workplace. And it's funny because I feel like starting out on TV, you kind of get like the best training. You're surrounded by some of the best and most eloquent communicators. You're like, this is the best place to learn. So after about 10 years, I decided to take everything that I learned on TV to now teach it to professionals and help empower them to show up and speak up confidently. And this is where we are today. And I host these Soulcast Media Live events about every other week. So if you, if this is your first time or you've been joining our sessions almost every other week, I'm so happy you're here. It's all meant to help you. So let's get started. Let's get started talking about what we're all here for, to discuss navigating change and thriving at work. And I'm so thrilled to invite my guest up. Her name is Libby Gill. And oh my gosh, where do I start? She actually told me behind the scenes, the scenes that she has had three career shifts already. But right now, she is an award-winning author, a leadership expert, and she is a fantastic person when you really want to get to understand leadership, growth, and how you can get into that mindset. So without further ado, let me bring up Libby. Libby, how are you? I'm good, Jessica. How are you? I can tell how you are. You're just full of life and energy. Oh, my goodness. And that's the thing, Libby, like, like I was saying, you know, communications and how we show up, you know, for some of us, including myself, it's not something that was just innate, right? Like it's something that we had to learn. But Libby... I want to hear about you, the work that you do, and how did you even get into this work of like leadership as well? Well, I started out, I have a degree in theater, never taken a business class in my life, theater and dance. And I started uh, working in Hollywood, working, temping at the different studios, landed a job in uh, public relations at a small company, which had been founded by a real television legend. You have to be closer to my age to know who Norman Lear is, but he was the guy that created 
really the format for sitcoms. Very progressive guy. That company was bought by Columbia Pictures. That company was bought by Coca-Cola. That company was bought by Sony. And so in my early career, there was a lot of change very rapidly. That was in less than five years. So I learned right off the bat, you either raise your hand and figure it out or you hide under your desk. So I decided I was going to be the raise your hand person. And I went from being an assistant to being head of of television, publicity, advertising, and promotion for Sony's worldwide television group in five years. So talk about getting thrown into the deep end like you were. It was sort of sink or swim, figure this out. And I was fortunate to have people that had 20 years of experience to my five suddenly on my team. So I had to really learn leadership very quickly. And one of the th first things I learned is when you get into that, I just now I call it the big scary meeting, whatever the big senior leadership meeting is or Monday morning meeting, it's really no different than what you were doing before. It might be more senior people, mm -hmm. but you still need to show up, contribute and participate. And that's that's what you talk about, having your voice heard. So after that career, I decided I I'd, I'd had enough. I always worked on the television side of the business and I've worked on so many shows, shows you would name from, you would know, from Married with Children to launching the Dr. Phil show. The, I did the PR launch for that show. And then I just thought, you know, I've had enough of TV. I'm going to take what I loved, which was helping people develop their own careers. And I started an executive coaching business, started writing books. I published six nonfiction books. And um, it's been a great career helping people get to that next level and understanding that how they communicate, how they show up, as you said, is really a huge part of how they are perceived. Yes. So doing the work is critical, but showing, demonstrating what you're doing is also critical. So those are sort of the first two waves of my career. And it's it's been a lot of fun. I've done a lot of speaking around the world, I've spoken in a bunch of different countries all across the United States and still working with just amazing clients every day. This is all to say, everybody who's here right now, you are in for a treat because we have so much we're going to share with you in terms of getting into that leadership mindset. And even if you are not in a quote unquote leadership position, it doesn't mean that you cannot start thinking that way and acting that way. And what Libby just said right now of, okay, a lot of it's a mentality. It's like, you just got to show up. And Libby, what you were saying about that really resonated with me because so so I'm currently writing a book as well, and I'm talking about oftentimes we can feel that struggle and that, I call it friction, friction in the workplace, mm -hmm. where we show up and we think that we have to just do the work and do it well. And yes, it's true. But you're like, wait a second, there's a lot more intangible skills yeah. that you're not necessarily taught in school. Things like communicating, teamwork, collaboration, advocating, that you're like, wait a second, I have to do these things and it's even more important. Whoa. And that's where that friction comes from. It, relationship building. I learned from my first boss. And I remember I was a young employee at the time and my colleagues and I thought, oh, this guy is, he goes out to lunch every day. And I learned to appreciate the fact that he was constantly building his network and that that's a huge part of business. I, I call it's not a very nice term, but I say a lot of people have they, they suffer the die at your death syndrome. I would rather finish this one last spreadsheet or this one last report, finish this work than let people see my face. And you can't always do that. Yes, of course, you've got to get the work done. But if you're not out talking to people, meeting people, finding out how you can better serve them and letting them get to see who you are and what you do, mm -hmm. you can really put yourself in a rut that can be very hard to get out of, you know, several years down the road. You know, I just did this post on LinkedIn that resonates exactly with what you're saying. It's it's this, it's this idea of we got to be proactive about crafting our own career brand because here's the thing. If you're not going to control it, somebody else is going to create that narrative for you. And if we care about our career, which I'm sure everybody here is and they do, we were putting in hours upon hours every week, just know this. 
You can control how people perceive you, your reputation. So working hard is not a career brand. Working hard is status quo, right? Yes, so it's like, okay, how do you want to be seen? Okay, so Libby, here's my first question for you as we kind of start diving into this. If somebody wants to be more proactive and thinking about how they are perceived at work, what are some of the tips you would share with people on helping them shape the perception they want? Well, first of all, you have to recognize that leadership is a choice. There is no more a leaders are born. We know that's not true. There's plenty of science behind that. Leaders are, are made, they are developed. So decide if you're a leader or you're not a leader. And if you decide you're not a leader, that's okay. But for those of us, you, me, Jessica, probably most, if not all of your listeners, we've made the decision. We want to lead in our lives. It's not the authority or the title. It's the yeah. decision to step up and take responsibilities beyond whatever your job description is. So that's the first thing. Make a decision to lead and then ask yourself, what kind of leader do I want to be? What do I want to be known as? I've had people tell me that they want to be known as a strong but kind leader. They want to be known as an innovative leader. They want to be a strategic leader. So we get to decide. I, I've always been a creative leader. That's, you know, I always had a big team. I cared, really cared deeply about the people and the teams. You know, I came from the studio world. And uh, it is not a warm and fuzzy environment, as you well know, in corporate entertainment. And so um, I, I made, it was part of who I was. And I liked the idea of working with the team and, and that sort of collaboration and that closeness. I like to know who my people were. You, you want to know them. You spend a lot of time with them. You want to know their, who was their spouses? What do they do for fun? And you don't have to all be best friends but you want to know this, them as humans, not just as corporate people or colleagues, but as who they are at their, at their soul. And so to me, that was very important. So it goes two ways. Think about how you want to be known. And then how do I insert that idea into other people's brains? And sometimes it's as simple as saying, hey, I love to generate ideas. Let me brainstorm with you. People will think of you as an idea generator. Gee, I'm great with numbers. I really, how can I help you work this, solve this problem? Or how can I synthesize this data? I am not, by the way. So that's nothing I would ever claim to do. But there are people that are great at taking data and help you either understand it or tell a story with it. So think about what your leadership superpower is. What are you just naturally great at? And how do you lean into that ability? And how do you share that with others? How do you describe it? And then, of course, you've got to live it, because if you describe it and it's not authentic, then you get busted for that pretty early. I mean, we all know those people that are great self-promoters, but there's nothing behind it. And mm -hmm. that's what you've done. It's worse to tell the story and not live it than it is not to tell it at all. But I do think we craft our own brands and we craft our, we chart our own career path. I think sometimes it's easy for us to take that back seat and just wait mm -hmm. in that more traditional sense of if I put in X number of years, this promotion will come. And I mean, okay, maybe early on in our career, it is true. You put in your two years or three years, you go from analyst to now manager and the manager, you know, it, there maybe yeah. is that trajectory. But I hear what you're saying. And, and what I love about what this what you're talking about is identifying, and I call this identifying your differentiating factor. It's mm -hmm. something that you do so well and you enjoy doing too. I feel like those two combine. When you enjoy and you're good at it, wow, that is powerful. But here's the other thing. Sometimes you're like, wait a second. I know I'm good at, you mentioned data. I know I'm good at doing and managing numbers and data, but I really want to learn how, how sales work. Mm -hmm. How can I leverage this differentiating factor and open opportunities in sales? It's something that seems so different. And anytime somebody asks me, I always say, leverage what you do do good at and offer it as almost like a service to help okay. somebody else. It's pretty, so, you know, if we ask most people are pretty good at, at responding. It's so funny. I'll go out and speak to a group and I'll, I'll sometimes I'll say, how many of you love to be asked for your advice, for your help, for your connections? Every hand in the room goes up. We love that. We feel good when we're tapped for our advice. And then how many of you feel great about going out and asking other people for help? And every hand goes down. So 
it's it, we sometimes think that yeah we're, we're happy to help other people but i don't know if i can ask mm -hmm. you, if you simply take what you know as you're saying you take your gift and you say hey you know let me learn more first thing is let me learn a little bit more about what you do it can be as simple as you know, do, is it appropriate in your culture, in your job? Do you ask somebody for lunch? Maybe you won't ask for four yes. levels up, yeah. but if it's appropriate and you say, hey, can, I, can, can we go out for coffee? I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you do. A, it's flattering. B, yeah. it's genuine. C, you're going to get some great input. And by the way, they're going to want to know what you do too. And it starts with something so simple. And uh, the saddest thing for me, when you mentioned, yes, you, you, you can't just do that work and not be known for it. You've got to get it out there. Mm -hmm. When I get a call from someone 20 years into their career and they say to me, you know, I've trained my last three bosses and they've gone on above and I'm still here and I'm kind of stuck now, you know, 20 years at the company and I don't know how to break out of that trap. It's, it's maybe not too late, but it's really hard at that point. You want to start being seen as someone who's available, accessible, has that kind of energy and confidence. Doesn't matter if you're 20 years old and this is your first job. You have a perspective that I don't have. You have a perspective that no one has just by being you. So you've got to get out and share that with other people. And by asking them about themselves and then, hey, would this be helpful to you? You've started the conversation. You've started the relationship. Absolutely. Actually, I'm very curious for those who are listening and watching, what industry are you all from? Uh, feel, feel free to write it into the chat function. Are you in the tech industry, finance, healthcare? Let us know in the chat function. It's always so amazing to see the, the diversity in industries where people are dialing in from. So yeah, put it into the chat function where you're dialing in from and what industry. So what the reason why I ask that is, you know, to loop it back to our conversation of navigating change and thriving at work, you know, it really doesn't matter like what industry we're in. All these are just fundamental, good working. I mean, would you say like habits or behaviors? Like I'm trying to figure out what like the well, right it, word is. It is mindset. As you yeah. said earlier, it's mindset, it's daily decisions, it's behaviors. And as an executive coach, I work with people and performance. That's my area. It's people excelling, doing well at their job and growing in the organization. And when coaching first started, and it's about 20 years ago, it was a, a little bit of how do you help a derailed executive? You know, somebody's being called into the principal's office. Mm -hmm. That has long since ceased. If an organization is going to invest in you to have a coach, they're looking at your growth. There's sometimes it's helping a new leader. Sometimes it's somebody who's switched over to a different discipline. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's somebody they think just needs a little extra help and support. And either the company doesn't have time or doesn't have the expertise to do that. But it's all about helping you shift to that from a fixed mindset, which is that, you know, I'm going to do what I do. I, I don't want anything else. I don't want to take any risks. I don't really want the feedback. I'm just going to keep going here to the growth mindset where you say, I love to try new things. I like to learn. I always welcome feedback. I'm okay if I fail. I learned that early on. You start your own business, you are destined to fail. And it's also kind of set in the corporate world as well. And it's where you set your bar. For me, success is if I learned something, it was a success. So I can do a project and it can just not turn out at all the way I thought it would. If I don't learn anything, yeah, I'll put that in the failure category and then I'll probably make the same mistake. But if I if it didn't work out and I learned something, it's like, oh, that's good. Now I know that. Mm -hmm. So either you don't do it again or you do it differently. And once you, you let go of that, that perfectionism, like, you know, I can't get it out in the world until it's perfect. You learn this writing a book. It's like, it's not gonna be perfect. You're going to have an editor who's going to say, let's change the, you know, the first time I had an edited book back, I gave it to a friend and said, you look at the edits first. I can't do it yet. And I let it sit for a couple of days before I could take it on. And then I've learned to see it, all feedback is, is really, you don't have to agree with it all. That's the beauty of feedback. You don't necessarily have to agree, but often if you've got people with far greater expertise than you have, then it's really great to get that feedback and understand where that's coming from. It's just part of the growth curve. It's amazing seeing all the different 
industries people say they are in, and you are probably seeing it too. It's a lot of HR, PR, pharmaceuticals, healthcare, food manufacturing, nonprofit coaching. And I love this. You know, everything that you're talking about in terms of having this growth mindset, I 100% agree. And, you know, I mentioned earlier about how, you know, I bet a lot of us here listening right now, we, we believe that too. We're here because we want to learn. If you're here, you're dedicating your your hour with us, it's because you want to learn. And oh my gosh, Libby and I are so happy that you are here. And I want to mention though that, you know, sometimes it's hard though to get into that mindset. And I'm just thinking about this because as I'm writing this book right now, which the reason I keep talking about it is because I'm literally doing it right now. Yeah. After this, I'm going to be writing the book. But one of the things I talk about is how some of us may gravitate more towards this more quiet mentality. And mm -hmm. it's not about being an introvert or extrovert. I, I call it having more of this like quiet culture. It's like a way of thinking how we like our environment, how we like to spend our time. A lot of it is more kind of in here, right? Mm -hmm. But the working world is what I would consider a very loud environment where they demand people participate, they debate, discourse, right? And sometimes these two juxtapositions can feel very conflicting. And yes. as a result, we don't know, like, what is the right thing to say? Because that quiet, the quiet culture in us is very like, oh, you sure you want to say that? Is that the right thing to say? Are people going to judge me, right? So sometimes we can just feel very stuck in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for me, like the way I coach people through getting out of that quiet and stuck mindset is thinking about the benefit to other people. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes a lot of the pressure off of you of like, am I going to sound funny? Am I going to sound silly? If you can think, okay, I know the work that I'm doing is important and I enjoy the work, but how does it help others, the team, the organization? That is the message you want to communicate. And I really feel like if you switch that mentality from a me to a we, it makes people see you in a completely different light. Is that something you see too? Oh, of course. Absolutely. And a couple of things that can be really handy is I often tell people to think of an image, think of a symbol that can help you. Uh, for example, I had a very introverted leader and I'm a situational extrovert. I'm not an, an extrovert. People assume I am because I can get up and talk to a thousand people with no problem. The VIP cocktail party, not as much fun being on the platform and talking a Easy. lot more comfortable. But you're right. The The workplace re rewards the extrovert. Yeah. I've got a blog on this about a great study. on. You don't necessarily even have to be accurate. And if you speak up, the workplace will see you as yeah. more of a leader. It's a very weird thing, but it's true. So you have to learn when to ramp up your voice. A mm -hmm. symbol, and I had one introverted leader who decided he really, and he was in competition for the next big job with a very extroverted leader. So, but he knew he was the more qualified guy. His image was a pouncing tiger. He knew he had to rev up the energy. He had to be ready to leap at a moment's notice. And that brought him up. I worked with another young woman who felt like she had a little bit of the up talk and which is something we got to work out of our vocabulary or, or the way we speak. And she felt she wasn't being perceived as having enough gravitas, enough importance. Mm -hmm. And I said, think of something that grounds you, that brings your voice down, that slows your pace. And she said, oh, you mean like a big bellied Buddha? And I said, exactly. And that became her go to image when she needed to have some some heft. And you can think about these things that that bring you down. But. When it gets to the, what do I say in the workplace? First of all, err on the side of action. You will be far more rewarded than erring on the side of staying hidden. But you can say things like, hmm, I need to process that. Let people know how you think and work. I've had a lot of people who say, well, I can't just blurt out like, you know, my colleagues will just throw something out there. It doesn't matter if it's right or not. It sounds good, but I don't work that way. Then you say, give me 24 hours. I really need to process this or I need to look at the data or give me two hours. I'll be back to you. Mm -hmm. You say that with confidence and conviction. P 
people will believe you and they will give you credit for wanting to do the homework behind it, as opposed to just saying something that you feel sort of half convinced is the right thing. It's you got to have those go to things in your pocket. Another one of my favorites when you're having that tension or somebody you're not getting through to somebody is the help me understand. Mm -hmm. Help me understand, Jessica, why you're seeing it this way and I'm seeing it this way. I, I help me understand your point of view. It's yeah. not blaming. You're not shaming anybody. You're saying, help me understand why you're not getting this project or task done is what you really want to say. Um, but you can say, help me understand if there's a, a time issue here or you've got too many other things on your plate. So have a few phrases, have your key go to this will open the door or solve the problem phrases. It just makes life easier because it's not going to happen once. Whatever that is <laughs> will be repeated. By the way, everybody can see there's a VIP pass here on the screen. And this is our way of we send you all the show notes after an event like this. So anything that, you know, Libby and I were talking about, all the tips we're giving you, if you did not get a chance to write it down, check out the VIP pass. So Libby, you mentioned something that really reminded me of. So recently I did, a, I was partnering with an HR um, team at a large tech company, Dell Tech. And I came in and I did a whole talk on actually advocating for yourself. Mm -hmm. And everything that you're saying reminded me of the tips I shared with the folks who attended that session. And, you know, when we talk about communications, right, sometimes we can get so in our head of like, is it the right thing to say? Am I going to sound weird? Is it going to sound silly? And for me, I always tell folks, think about it this way. If you communicate the process, what's going on, how it happened, your mm -hmm. thought process, people will not only understand how things came to be, they're going to be more invested. And if things do not go as planned, they will feel that they've already been looped into the process. Yeah. Because what's the worst thing that can happen, especially in a working world, when somebody's caught off guard? Yeah. It makes them look bad. It makes you look bad. It's better that other people know what's going on ahead of time. Because if we talk about credibility, we haven't talked too much about credibility, yeah. but isn't that the quickest way to shatter credibility when you're catching people by surprise? Yeah. So it's all about communicating the process. Yeah. Nobody likes surprises in the business world. And another tip for that, getting past that discomfort of speaking up is as particularly for the introverted leaders that find that hard, especially in the meeting with a lot of more senior folks, is think about, you can plan what you're gonna say. Take in you know, your notes on a little note card that you stuck in your pocket or in your, in your binder, where you've got a question to ask or you've got a comment you wanna make. Think about that in advance so it's easier. And speak up, if it's an hour long meeting, speak up in the first 10 to 15 minutes. Otherwise, Anxiety starts ramping up and you get too scared to say what you were going to say or someone else says exactly and you think, oh, that's exactly what I was going to say. But they've already said it. You can't repeat it. So be prepared, even if it feels a little artificial at first, mm -hmm. it will become so much easier as you get used to making a comment, asking a question, bringing up a new topic. You really have to practice those things. Practice in your low risk environment at your own meeting or a, an easier meeting before you take that on in some of the bigger meetings. Build that confidence muscle. Absolutely. Actually, Laura, I see your question about what's the book you're talking about. The book that I was talking about is actually the one I'm writing. It's still in the process right now. So uh, it's coming out next year, but be sure to follow. We'll Follow, follow both me and Libby on LinkedIn. We talk a lot about it, but that's where I'm going to share updates about the book. But one of the things that um, you mentioned, Libby, that I want to talk about is this idea of speaking up in meetings and how you mentioned speaking up sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Now, for people including myself, who tend to overthink situations. This was this was something that was very hard for me. I tend, I tend to be the kind of person who likes to just kind of sit back and observe the conversation mm -hmm. and then be like, okay. But that, the problem is, it's what you said. Sometimes when you think too long, the conversation has already, we're talking about something else now. Yeah. Right. One of my favorite tips to help people speak up more confidently in meetings is actually to figure out when's the right time to chime in, because that's often the hardest. Like, right. how do you gauge, like, is that pause the right time? So one of my favorite tricks is this. If you want to seamlessly interject yourself into a conversation, actually paraphrase what the person said right before you. 
Oh, Libby, you mentioned growth mindset. It made me think of A, B, and C. For you, Libby, I'm sure when you hear me do that, you're thinking, oh, Jessica heard what I had to say. I don't feel like she's cutting me off. But if you're like, wait a second, wait a second, I want to add this. It's kind of like you're kind of like, oh, whoa, like somebody just cut me off. So it's all about being seamless in how you interject. And the best way to do it is by paraphrasing what somebody said. Now, let me be clear. Paraphrasing doesn't mean you agree. It just means that you heard what the other person said. And that's a great way to get people to start listening to you. Yeah, and related to that, there's this great thing called the art of amplification that I talk about a lot. It is, it, this came in the, during the Obama administration, this is not a political thing, by the way, but it came because there, there weren't a lot of women um, in Congress or in the Senate. And so women decided they needed to amplify each other's voices. And it just worked like this. Jessica says, uh, we need to think about our, you know, our storytelling brand. And then I would say, oh, Jessica, that's really interesting. I don't have to agree, but I'm going to second what you said. I'm going to give you airtime and more visibility by saying either, that's a great point. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Or, you know, I don't know if that's our priority, but I'd love to hear why you think that's important. So what you're doing is giving that person th the table. You're saying, continue on. We've given you authorship of that statement, a little bit more ownership and a little bit more airtime. And you can do this simply by role modeling it for others, or you can collude with your colleagues and say, hey, let's make sure us junior members are reinforcing others' voices. And you just learn to amplify others. And it becomes it, it becomes a self-fulfilling thing that you begin to get your, your voice heard and, and others do as well. How amazing is that? You're yeah. paving the way for other people. And ultimately, it's a win-win situation. And I love how you said earlier about like, hey, you can kind of have this conversation behind the scenes. Like when we get into that two o'clock meeting, let's make sure yeah. that I will try to speak up first and then I'll pave the way for you to speak up next. And we will say each other's names too. I think that's a huge part of it. Yeah. Libby, that was such a great idea. I think just very unconsciously and subconsciously, these are very powerful. Like You're tying their name to their idea because what happens often is you can throw something out and somebody runs with it. They forget. I hear this from so many people, you know, and sometimes it's not malicious or intentional. It's just they take your idea and run and nobody even remembers you had anything to do with that, even though it was yours. Another thing, I have an executive who, who works in the retail world, big retail, and she has created a lot of institutional things. And people forget that she was the one 10 years ago that came up with this framework. And I said, you've got to name it. You've got to have an actual brand name on that. And if you can put your own name on it in a fun or playful way, that really brands it to you. But you've got to say, remember my whatever. And people will begin to know, oh, yeah, that was Jessica's idea. Yeah, we have that checklist because she created it for us at that meeting last year. So begin to own and let people know, be proud of, of your own what you bring to the table and don't be shy about, you know, claiming some of those things. Yes, sometimes you claim it as a team, but sometimes people will do that to their own detriment that they will hide so far. I just heard a horrendous story from one of my leaders who worked on a big event and then decided she didn't need to be there because the event was so well in hand. She didn't have to show up. And uh, fortunately, she did. But I thought, wait a minute, people won't even associate you with this great outcome if you don't show up at your own leadership meeting that you, mm -hmm. you know, you took the time to set up this big conference. You need to be there front and center. So we can't, hum, humble is good. Humility is good. Humble to a fault, not so good. So we've got to be aware of where the line is between the two of those. I love this word about you saying about showing up. And this is one of my favorite things to talk about, actually, because think about all the meetings that we are in, let's say the big team meetings, and how easy is it for us, especially virtual meetings, to just kind of sit back, our boxes, our, our, our cameras are not turned on. And the thing is, you know you're there, right? You're listening. But do other people know that you're there and you are engaged? Now, the easy thing for me to tell everybody right now is speak up, right? Talk. But I get how it cannot be 
so easy for some people. But the thing is, people still need to know that you're there and that you're engaged. So this is where I even say putting and commenting on the chat function is just a way for people to see your name, know you're there, and know you're present. You don't need to get into this full-on discussion, but just knowing people can see and hear you, or not maybe not hear you, but see your name, that's huge. That's if huge. me having the camera off on a Zoom call is an absolute no-no. If, if anybody's on a call of mine and they've got their camera off, if, if it's a business, it's turn it on or, or, you know, or don't excuse yourself from the meeting and don't be there. And in person, you got to think about where you sit. A big mistake people make is they think I had one leader who thought, I just want my team to shine. So I want them at the conference table with the senior execs and I'll take a back seat. Big mistake. She was meant to be there and in charge. And as a leader, it was fine if there was room for her team, but you can't sit back there and assume that, that people will recognize that you're there. You have to literally show up and literally take a seat at the table. And the power seat, if you're in a conference room, and if you have your choice, by the way, of being remote or being in person, you should be in person while you're trying to build your career, particularly and build your brand. If given the option and you can go in person and the power seat, but you know, your CEO may have claimed it already, is if the door, you know, we're in a a conference room, the doors over here, it's not at the end of the table, it's the center across from the door because you are in contact with the most number of people. You've got people along your side, you can see the whole table at that side. That's the power seat. And if you think like animal kingdom, you know, the the scared little the rabbits are gonna sit back and freeze, but the predators the bears and the wolves and the lions are going to take up space. So put your arm on the table, take up a little space. Don't, don't shrink down into a little ball. People will notice you if you claim your spot. I know this can sound a lot, like a lot, right? For everybody who's watching, we're like, oh God, like this is so much for me to think about and do. And here's the thing, you don't need to do all of it, but I do think just remembering and it all comes down to just when we finish this chat, you know, when you go back to your day-to-day -day work, what's one or two things you can remember from what we talked about today yes. and try to apply those things. Actually, my favorite tip is I always have like sticky and post-it notes next to my computer because anytime I remember something really, really awesome, I write it down and I take it and I just post it next to my computer. It's just a way for me to remind myself of what's the behavior, what's the habit, or what's that saying that I want to keep with me? All right. So by the way, we have been chatting for over 40 minutes now, and it's just yeah. gone by so fast, Libby. I think we're just having so much fun. I want to make sure we get to some questions uh, that people have. So right now, if anybody has any questions for either Libby or I, this is your time to ask us. So open the chat function. And if there's anything related to your career, how you're feeling, perhaps you're facing this workplace conflict, put it into the chat function and Libby and I will do our best. Now, I do see one of the first questions. This is how to handle the conflicts in the meeting in a diplomatic way. Libby, what are your thoughts on this? So conflict happens in the workplace, but how do we handle it diplomatically? If you're in a meeting and other people are present, obviously, Criticism should be done one on one. Uh, credit should be shared publicly. So think about that first. But assuming you're in a disagreement with someone, you can say, I don't really agree with that statement. And here's why. Just share your point of view. Or I'm not sure I understand what you're trying to say here. Just own your own point of view. You don't have to say you don't know what you're talking about. If you start with where you're coming from, it's like, Jessica, I, I don't quite get that. Can you explain it for me? Or I don't agree and here's why, because when we did it this way, here's what happened. So explain your perspective and your point of view. What's the conflict? Uh, find the meeting ground. You may not solve it on the spot. You may say, hey, maybe we should take this offline so we don't waste anybody else's time or so that we come back to the table with a, with a, a workable solution we can present. So don't take it as a personal attack. You don't need to get heated up about it. Just Remember, part of your job is to diffuse anxiety. If you just think, I'm just going to 
keep it calm, keep it cool. Then everybody else is going to take a breath and think, oh, this is not going to escalate. Mm-hmm. Instead, just diffuse the anxiety and take it down a notch and say, hey, another thing is with texts or emails, if those start to get heated or escalate, pick up the phone or walk yes. down the hall, never escalate a problem in a written message. Yes. That's just crazy because the, the, there's no tone. You don't know what the other person meant. You can't tell if it was something was said with humor or with kindness. Go talk about it. So I I, don't, I never experienced it. We had a lot of problems. I've worked in a very volatile, change-oriented workplace, but it was always a discussion. You think this, I think this. Well, let's figure out which is the better way. And then you kind of sometimes have to disagree and proceed. Mm-hmm. So somebody needs to make the call, whether everybody's in agreement or not. It's either the leader who makes the decision. Maybe it's a consensus, but you, you there are times you will just disagree and go forward. Right. You know, when I hear the word being diplomatic in the workplace, the thing that I think about instantly is not making people feel bad about their ideas. It's as simple as that. You know, the quickest way to get people to feel very defensive, the quickest way for people to not want to hear what you have to say is when you start viciously criticizing their idea and how it was a terrible idea. I think being diplomatic is letting the other person know that you heard their idea, you considered their idea, you found value in the way they perhaps thought about their idea, but maybe there is another way to look at it. And that is why I talked about earlier of, uh, you know, just this simple exercise of paraphrasing what somebody said, that is the best way to, to let other people know that you heard them, you know, even aside from work, I just think about sometimes the conversations I'll have with my husband. Right. And then he was like, he would just be like, I just want to feel like you heard me right? He'll even say things like that. And it's like, that's true. Like, it's not like he needs me to like help solve his problems or me. I have to give him a whole list of solutions. He just wants to hear me say, I hear what you're saying. Okay. You said A, B, and C. He just wants me to paraphrase. And I feel like, gosh, that's, it's actually so much more easy that way. Yeah. I will sometimes say to my husband, can I just, I'm just going to vent for a minute. (laughs) He, 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 and he knows he doesn't have to fix anything. He, he just has to say, OK, you vented. Yeah, I heard. That's it. You know, it's, it's even a preface of I'm just going to whine for a second here because this person's driving me crazy. Yeah. Uh, so one other question. This is actually a question that came in the very beginning. So I want to make sure I get to it. But any tips on starting a new position, tips on changing workplaces and how to begin on the right foot would be appreciated. Libby, any tips on starting a new position? Yeah, you've got about 90 days to do what you need to do to to make yourself known there. And um, think about small wins. Think about small wins. If you see on the job, there are things you can accomplish, things that, you know, somebody has been waiting for someone to handle or take off their plate. Tackle those small wins and get out and meet the key people immediately and ask them things like, what would success mean for you in this role? What is it I need to do to most impact your business unit? Ask those questions. Six months or year to be ignorant. You need to come in right from the beginning. And even if it's scary, ask your supervisor, or your HR manager, who are the six, five, depending on the size of the business, who are the five or 10 people I should get acquainted with right away? And just the question is simple. I'm new here. I'd really like to learn a little bit more about your business or my boss, fill in the name, said I should get to know you. Do you have 10 minutes? May I drop by your office? There you go. Ask a couple of questions. What's most important to your team? How do I impact it? Where do I cross connect? What would success be in this role for you? That's it. Start with that. It's it's easier than you think. And some people just think they've got to like hit it out of the park immediately. But you can't be invisible. You've got to show up again. It's about getting out there. The key word that you said, I think, is the word get acquainted. And mm-hmm. getting acquainted means you've got to get out there. You've got to meet people. You have to have those one-on-one meetings. And you have to also be visible in the team meetings. You know, your first 90 days, which is, I think a lot of people talk about those. Yeah, the first three months at your first job, this is where impressions are being made. And I think you have to approach it strategically. Don't just think, I start a new job. I have to start working really hard. 
Think working hard is meeting as many people as you can, having as many conversations as you can. And we talked about earlier, people generally like to talk about themselves and the work that they do. So if you go in and you're like, wow, I really admire what you've done with A, B, and C. Can I just chat with you about how you did that? Exactly. If you do that within your first three months, people are like, who are you? Like, I want to get to know you too. Right. I had a fellow I was working with who changed industries and he was at a high level. And he said, oh, I came from this industry to this one. And now I'm, I'm at a VP role and there's so much I don't know. And I said, you've got a lot of forgiveness. You need to find out who your allies are right away. Go get on a plane. He was in a position he could do that. Get on a plane. Go meet with your six stakeholders. This is the time that and he was a relatively young guy for a high level job. I said, this is going to be the time they're going to take you under their wing and they're going to say, you know what, Bill, here's what would really work for me. And that's exactly what happened. He just didn't think, oh, you mean actually go there physically and meet with them and, you know, Cleveland and Dallas. And yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, you've got the ability to do it. Go do it. First of all, they're going to be impressed that you took the time and the effort to go down to them. And secondly, you can't do this later. You can't ask for, he was going to do things like, I need a backfill of, he was just, it could not say, I don't know. He had the whole corporate lingo of information backload and blah, blah, blah. I said, just go meet with them and say, hey, there's a lot I haven't learned yet. Where, where do I start? What do you need from me? And he did that half a dozen times. And they thought, this guy is the greatest hire we've ever made. You know, sometimes I think we overcomplicate the situation. Oh. It's like, just think about how you would feel if somebody approached you and asked yeah. you questions. Do the same thing. Now, there's no doubt your first three months at a job, it's going to be a lot. You're yeah. going to be working a lot. But that's expected, right? But your work shouldn't just be what you said, like, let me collect all the data and all the information. It's no, your first 90 days is to talk and meet with as many people as you can. Okay. Um, one question that I want to get to, this is from Nia. What are a few resources you recommend to improve executive presence? I'll, I'll share my really quick one and then Libby, I'll throw it to you. Uh, Nia, when it comes to executive presence, I highly, highly, highly recommend. Um, so I'm also a LinkedIn learning instructor and my most popular LinkedIn learning course is actually an executive presence course. It's called Developing Executive Presence on video. Uh, go on LinkedIn Learning. It's been watched by over 1 million people from all over the world. I highly recommend it. Uh, but that is a really great resource if you want to think about developing executive presence, especially if you work virtually. But Libby, any thoughts on executive presence? I do a lot of this one-on-one -on -one with people, but there are a couple of great books. Quiet, is a great book that it just tells you how introverted leaders think. And it may give some comfort to people who aren't very comfortable speaking up. And um, yeah, I think looking at your video is probably a great way to do it. It's, it's really just thinking about also having that sense of what is it about me that makes me lacking in that kind of confidence? An another good tip is find a partner and it may be your own boss if you have that relationship of when you go into a meeting, know that you're going to ask your boss, you've got permission from a colleague or your supervisor that you're going to say, I want you to tell me how I showed up in that meeting and I want you to give me any pointers. Don't do it in a needy, neurotic kind of way. Just, hey, would you be willing to um, just give me some quick feedback after this presentation, meeting, whatever? Most people, especially if it's the folks on your team or on your side that are rooting for your success, will tell you the truth. I have one leader who does not have a poker face. She's got like, as soon as somebody says she needs to do something, instead of saying, I need to think about this, she does one of these like, oh, and people think she doesn't want to do it. We have tried everything from her boss now, every time she does it, I said, we need you to sort of have a way to be kicked under the table. I said, I want you to do this. It was a really weird thing. I said, I want you to go into that meeting, plant one foot on the floor, and then put your other foot like with your, you know, whatever your boot or your high heel square on top of that foot and sit really uncomfortably through that whole meeting so that you're aware of that awkward position, because that's your reminder that what you're doing in your body is coming out your face. And she said that was the strangest thing. And it totally worked. I was so aware of my body through that meeting. I didn't make a single one of those like I don't want to do it faces. Um, so it's, it's all of these different things and you have to try these things and see what works for you. Yeah. 
You know, sometimes I feel like it's the silliest things that yeah. stick and we feel like we have to always, I like, think and act so professionally in that way. I feel like it doesn't have to be, it reminds me of a story, Libby. So I was working with somebody um, on getting them out of this mindset because they, they would always think worst case scenario. So I was working with this person who would always default to, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. My boss wants to fire me. I'm going to be called into HR. Something did wrong. I did wrong. And so when I was working with her, we were trying to figure out how she could get out of this negative mentality. And it's very similar to, we talked about earlier of this idea of like, you know, naming and labeling like the thoughts. And I said, hey, label this thought. What is your least liked vegetable? Celery. I really don't like celery. That's it. Label that negative thought celery. What vegetable do you like? I like mushrooms. Make sure that you continuously think of those mushrooms and those positive thoughts. Yeah. So silly, but sometimes those are the things that we need. Yeah. Yeah. I have one person thinks who thinks of herself as a, a fountain of wisdom. And it's gotten her to sort of open up and share. Another one who's like beams of sunlight so that she puts a, she's because she's got a worry face. She comes to Zoom with her worry face. It's like, no, 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 you gotta, we're going to get rid of that. Now you're just going to show up with a beam of sunlight on your face. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it is those things. And they become habitual. They become part of your DNA and they just get easier over time. All right. I'm I'm so sad that we have completely ran out of time. And I know there's so some questions that we did not get to. So this is what I'm going to ask. Please connect with both me and Libby on LinkedIn. Send us a note. So don't just connect with us or follow us, but like put in a message like you were here at this event. And if you have a question for us, put it in there. And, you know, Libby, I mean, I will do our best to answer any questions we did not get to answer. But if folks want to follow you and the work that you do, where can they do that? Just go to my website, LibbyGill.com. You can sign up for my newsletter. I don't overdo it, believe me. Um, and Or just reach out directly at Libby at LibbyGill.com. I keep it pretty easy. I love it. So first of all, I want to say thank you to everybody who joined in on our conversation. Hopefully you found it as exciting as and as enlightening as I, you know, we did. And you all were able to walk away with some golden nuggets. As I mentioned earlier, the VIP pass, which you see here on your screen, that is a way for us to send you all the show notes from this event and actually all our events. So you're not having to furiously write down everything that we're talking about because we share a lot of great tips. Now, I mentioned earlier that we do host these Soulcast Media Live events every other week or so, and I'm very excited to share our next one is going to be in about two weeks, and it's going to be with the author of Radical Candor. I don't know if you know her, uh, Kim Scott. So she's coming on and she's talking about Radical Candor. She's talking about how we can get into the right working mindset it's going to be a great event. So for those who are interested in joining that, I'm going to drop a link right now in the chat function, soulcastmedia.com slash event. That is where you can RSVP for that. Or you can just get on our email list, soulcastmedia.com slash tips, because that is where we share all our events and tips as well. So with that, Libby, I want to say thank you so much for spending your, I guess, er, your early afternoon with us exactly. and for sharing your wisdom. And for those who are not connected with Libby, be sure you connect with her also on LinkedIn and on her website. And I look forward to seeing you all soon. All right. Thank you, everybody. And thank you. Thank you.